Uh, we're going to start our, our pre-service um. sing. And uh, since this is supposed to be camp time and we're supposed to be kind of, we normally would be enjoying our time. Uh, we're going to go back to some of the songs in the Christian praise. Do we have any and extra Christian praises? Oh, yes, in yeah, the windows in there's the window. a Christian praise. Right there? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's so hard since we don't have people, we don't have songbooks for everybody, but uh, everybody in the church is, we expect you to really, really sing really well, really loud. So uh, people out in the parking lot can hear us. So here we go. We're going to sing 112 in the book. Will your anchor your anchor firm in Christ you know if we are the storms of COVID the storms that that befall us are not going to shake us or move us so we can trust in Christ when our anchor is in him how about 85 in Christian praise 85 so what you're kind of getting here is kind of the songs that, I sat last night for about a couple hours and I could kind of sing through all these. So you're kind of getting my hit, my hit list, my or my my hit list, my hit hits that I like. Let's go see on my hit list. That only be Paul. So. Come on. 
And you know that's the Holy Spirit. And you can experience His Holy Spirit when we invite Him into our hearts. What's another good camp song that I have? Let's go to 299. <laughs> Some people already know that just by the number. <laughs> yeah, so that's a favorite. 299. Oh, boy. Once a sinner far from Jesus, I was perishing with cold. But the blessed Savior heard me when I cried. Let's look. 769. 769 moving up home. Is that the one, Linda? Okay, you're going to have to come up here and sing it with me. No. unto the Lord <laughs> and uh, that is one I do not know um, anyways it's a good one because we are going to move up heaven someday that is our goal that's our aim and uh, um, let's go to 256 
256. save and power in the blood to to forgive us our sins and there's power in the blood to keep us Amen. and help us to, to live yeah. in the way that Christ yeah. wants us to live so um, I think I've got that honey oh. 278 I think 278 will be our last okay. pre-service song if that's okay 278 tis so sweet Amen. to trust in Jesus we, we can't trust ourselves we you know our friends will let us down, but Christ never fails. We can trust in him and know that he uh, is faithful to his word and he loves us so much. He'll do anything. So, so 278. Tis so sweet to trust in
pre-service camp meeting songs. And uh, it is just good to be in God's presence today. And we're just glad to see everyone here. Um, if you're hot in the cars, we still have a few seats in here where you might be able to squeeze in and get cool. So, uh, but if you're comfortable out there, that's great too. We're just glad to have everybody in the church and in the parking lot. And uh, it's just a blessing to have you here. Uh, it's a, uh, it's uh, we're, we've been kind of looking forward to this to have uh, Pastor Elvin back speaking with us, and uh, because he has left such a great heritage here in the church of the, the word declared, and uh, we uh, are excited that our pastor uh, is taking a couple weeks off just to get refreshed. He's really worked hard the last 16, 18 months, folks. Our, our pastor has been working hard, and uh, um. So uh, he is justly deserving his, his vacation he's taken for the next couple of weeks. And I just pray, and we should all be praying for him to be refreshed type thing. That uh, he, right, he's, he comes back ready to be uh, firing all cylinders and just declaring the word like he has been. So uh, we're just excited just to keep things going here. And uh, we just keep trusting the Lord because... We haven't seen a whole lot of movement, uh, or they've changed a few things, but the Lord can help us through whatever it is. And so we just keep trusting Him, and uh, it's just great to be in the church. So um, I'm going to ask my wife to open in prayer. She had that scared look, so, <laughs> so I'm going to have her open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you be with us in the service today, that your name would be honored and glorified, Lord, and song and word, Lord, that we would just go uh, home just uh, refreshed and ready to um, just uh, start the week of praising and serving you, Lord. Like, And we just pray that you be with each one that's here, and um, bless just bless us today. Yes. Amen. Amen. So... Uh, uh, we're going to turn to our new church hymnal, the, the brown one in the, in the uh, seat, and we're going to 457. He brought me out because I don't want to waller in sin and where I used to be. I want to, that new position, I want to be in Christ. I want to be moving in his spirit. So he brought me out. And this kind of goes with Brother pa uh, brother, brother Elvin, Pastor Elvin's uh, message about Nehemiah today and uh, where he brought the people out and they brought them back and encouraged them to build the city. So he brought me out. Okay. My heart was distressed He's Jehovah's dread frown And lo in the pit where my sins dragged me down I cried to the Lord from the deep
Hallelujah. Amen. We're almost there. We're not quite there, but we're close. We're close. This is camp. Let's turn to number 393. 393 in the course, in that songbook. There shall be showers of blessing. And I know Jim out in the car is praying for showers for his garden, and probably you are too, but uh, oh, the blessings when Christ showers us with his love. There shall be showers of blessing. There shall be showers of blessing. announcements um, so I am going to come to the Lord type thing and uh, we're just going to ask why don't we stand as we pray Father we are so grateful to be in your house Jesus you have proven your love for us time and time again even sometimes Lord God when we don't deserve it but Jesus you love us and keep loving us and God, we're so thankful for that love. And God, I just pray, Lord Jesus, that as we have come together today as a body in the parking lot and in the church here today and in the surrounding community, Lord Jesus, that you would move on the hearts, that you would love and bless your people here that are gathered, Lord Jesus. We just pray, Lord God, for those who come with needs and God, with hearts that are, are hurting, Lord God, 
for those people who have scars, Lord Jesus, that sometimes, Lord, we, that they don't seem to erase or go away. We just pray that your Holy Spirit now would come upon us. And Jesus, that you would be doing a work right now in the hearts of everyone here today, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord God, as Brother Alvin comes and speaks the word, Lord Jesus, that you would open up the word and the Bible and the scripture, Lord Jesus, that it might change us and, and, and do a work in us, Lord God, I pray. I just pray, Lord Jesus, for every need that was mentioned here today. Lord Jesus, we know you can answer it. You have the power, Lord God. And Jesus, by your blood, we just accept uh, your will, Lord God. We just ask that you would move in each situation, God. We're so thankful for your love and your blessing, Jesus. And without it, God, we would be lost. We would be nothing. We would be floundering, Lord God, without it. So, Jesus, again, I pray by your spirit, visit us today here in this church. Amen. 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 Let's stay sit standing and uh, let's sing uh, out of our chorus book, one of my favorites, What a Day. That's number 232. <laughs> morning uh, as a congregation is because he lives and they're trying to strip us of all our, our uh, the things that we hold dear but because he lives we can go on we can face each trial each thing that comes our way because Christ lives and uh, he is waiting to reach out to you to give impart to you uh, his spirit and his power so let's sing uh, 122 because he lives. In this book. Oh, okay. Yeah. In the, in the. Yeah. Okay. This is why I have a, my wife. <laughs> it's, it's in the hymn book, 122. Sorry, I.
I can live too. It's him that helps us to live each day. Well, we're going to have a special in song. Well, it'll be two thirds special because I'm singing it. So I'm the one third that's not so special. But uh, <laughs> Pastor Elvin and Linda are going to come and we're going to sing a song for you. Yeah. Sherry, can we start with the chorus just because in honor of Pauline. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> he looks a lot. He looks a little scarier with the mask off. But uh, yeah, I get some oxygen in. Yeah. Uh, all I just wanted to say is, some, <clears throat> some of you know, I, I, I still, in some of the areas of my personality, I'm like the two-year-old, do myself. Everything was do myself. But. This song came out of Minor Richardson, Robert George Armstrong's second wife. Mm -hmm. When she sang this the first time, I thought that was the silliest song I ever heard. Because why on earth could you not just lean on yourself and do your stuff and just stop? But you know, life became life. And I knew why I needed the Lord. Why I needed to lean on him. Then COVID, and then Satan. <clears throat> bringing all the things that he can bring. Now, as I said to God this morning, I've never leaned on you more than I have in this last while. But I know who to turn to. And one of the verses says, he'll help me with each task if only I'll ask. Every day now. Three. 
Oh, I'll never forget you. There's so many things he stands for prayerless last week. Man, oh, I can't go into details. There's so many things. I was thinking, how do I know, Lord, about the Holy Saints? And yeah. <laughs> Every single one. Everyone. Just when you think it's not going to work out, he comes through. The word always fails. That always fail. He never fails. It's the only one I can trust. The only one. If you had problems this morning, we've heard many, many, many through the prayer concerns. He'll never fail you. He'll never steer you wrong. I was almost dead, Jude. He'll never steer you wrong. Keep on the fiery line. I think that's the song that Nehemiah was singing as he made his way. To Jerusalem, don't you? I'm learning to lean. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy to us. And now as we look into this passage of Scripture, we ask that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would rest upon us, and that we would all receive from your hand. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, 25 to 33, don't, I'm not going to read from there, so uh, just referring, it, <clears throat> referring to it. There Jesus talks about counting the cost. Why? To determine if we're willing to pay the price. Don't you do that when you go shopping? You check it over, there's some things I'd love to have, but not paying that price for it. And that's what Jesus was getting at when it comes to following Him. There's a price to pay. And uh, we have to determine whether or not we're willing to pay it. The question is not, should we be soul winners? Of course we should be. Should we build a church? Of course we should. Should we be more spiritual? Yes, we must be. Should we be obedient to the will of God? Of course. That's required. But the first question is this, am I willing to pay the price for these things to happen? There is a price attached. 1946, my parents <clears throat> bought a farm in Violet from a Mrs. Close. Dad had just been released from the Army, and this is where we were to live. And thank God for that. Violet, to me, was like a sort of Shangri-La. A secluded and friendly environment, and we went to, one, to a one-room school with eight grades. We attended the standard church there in Violet. Occasionally we ventured into Napanee or King, Kingston for the necessary supplies, and for the most part I felt very safe in Violet. Next to our home and school, the church was the focus of our life. We were there for all the services, Sunday school, uh, Sunday school. We came over here Sunday morning for service. We were there for all the services and revival services, special occasions like Easter convention and so on. I witnessed the power of God in that church. The blessing of God, I've seen it coming upon his people. I've seen the altars lined with seekers. I've seen saints fall under the power of the Holy Spirit. There are scenes of victory over sin. Others experienced healing, physical healing there. Those times in the Violet Church left an indelible mark upon my life. But today, that building has fallen into disrepair. It has been turned into a garage or workshop or whatever the uh, people who reside there turned it into. Most of the time, I don't even notice it as I pass by, but occasionally I'll look at it and I wish that it had been torn down. And what was last year, we thought it was going to burn down, but unfortunately it didn't. Uh, the, there was another church in Violet. It was torn down some years ago, back in the 30s. It's sad to see that church. 
I understand and agree with the selling of the church in the Parsonage in Violet in order to renovate and enlarge the Wilton Church here, but those memories of Violet Church live on in my heart. I wonder if something like this was going through Nehemiah's mind when he heard of the destruction of Jerusalem. He had heard many stories about Jerusalem. I don't know if he'd ever visited or not, but he heard the stories. In this second chapter, we read the account of Nehemiah evaluating the situation in Jerusalem. Nehemiah was convinced that things had to change and he was willing to pay the price for that to happen. Now, if you turn to Nehemiah chapter 2, we're starting at verse 11. I'm just going to comment as we go through that portion, those portions of Scripture. <clears throat> verse 11 Nehemiah had arrived in Jerusalem. He says, three days after my arrival at Jerusalem. He was there. Uh, he didn't make big speeches. There is no posting of contract bids for rebuilding the walls. There are no spectacular assemblies of people to hear what he had to say. Instead, he waited in what appears to be silence. God had not yet told him to start building or anything else for that matter. He was waiting on God for his direction and his uh, leadership. In verse 12, he says, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack am animals with us, except the donkey that I myself was riding. Still nobody knew what Nehemiah was doing in Jerusalem. Maybe they thought he just came to pay like a pilgrimage or see some relatives or whatever. He had not told anyone what God had put in his heart. He hadn't said that yet. There's a, this is an important statement in this verse 12. What my God had put in my heart to do what my God had put in my heart to do. Have you ever experienced that? God putting something in your heart, something to do, something to do for a person, something to do for the church, something to do for a mission, or whatever it may be. It could be anything. It could be big or it could be small. Now, Nehemiah had first heard the disturbing news about Jerusalem while he was serving the Persian king, Eratoxerus. Now, I may have probably mispronounced his name, but he won't mind. Uh, the Persian king in the winter capital of Susa, now the general area of Iraq and Kuwait. After hearing the news, Nehemiah, in verse 4, we read, he wept and mourned, he fasted and is prayed. Let me read verse 4. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. He wept at what he heard about Jerusalem. It was a mess. Everything was destroyed. In fact, for days I mourned and fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. This was his first response to this horrifying news about Jerusalem. It was a wise reaction, I think. Too often, church work starts out with a flurry of proposals and ideas, suggestions, and tentative plans. And then we ask God to bless what we've come up with, if we even remember to do that. But the result of his intercession for Jerusalem was that God called him to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And this is what my God had put in my heart to do. God may not call you to rebuild the walls of a city or something like that, but he calls you to do something. It may be big, it may be small. Look around you. There are disturbing things taking place. Sinners are going to hell. There's a steady increase of godlessness. The country is opening its, its arms to the devil's agenda, while Christians feel battered and bruised by everyday living. While struggling, they, feel, they struggle against a pessimistic, uh, complaining, and critical spirit of false believers. We see the need to build the church and yet feel bound by our circumstances, our lack of skill, and a general feeling that there is a resistance, no doubt a demonic resistance to what God wants us to do. Now here's the question. 
Will you let God put something in your heart to do for him? Will you open your heart to that? If he calls you to do something, are you willing to do it? Nehemiah was. Now, what he may call you to do may be small. It may be obscure. Maybe no one will know about it. Not even your spouse. Who knows? It may be difficult. It may be sacrificial quite often. Doing what God wants us to do becomes sacrificial. It may be opposed by people, ridiculed by individuals, sometimes people who call themselves Christians. But the Lord has put something in your heart. It will be a good work. Remember what Nehemiah said later in chapter 3, verse 3, or verse 1, chapter 6, verse 3. Get my numbers right. I am doing a great work, he said to his persecutors, I'll call them. I'm doing a great work. Why? Because it was God's work. It wasn't his work. It was God's work. It wasn't great because he was involved. It was because God had called him. Now, in verse 13, we see Nehemiah inspecting the walls of Jerusalem. He says, I went out through the valley gate, past the jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey couldn't get through the rubble. So I went up to the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered, entered at the valley gate, again at the valley gate. Now, the word inspect that is used here is a medical word, meaning to probe a wound to determine the extent of the damage. Maybe you had the pleasure of having a doctor explore a wound or a cut, or maybe you've had those scopes going in through your body and all that stuff. Well, that's, they do that so they know how bad it is, what the da damage is. And that's what he was doing. He went at night in secrecy. He saw the walls broken down, the gates burned, the city cluttered with rubbish. He saw the poverty and the distress of the people. And Nehemiah went with open eyes to see what God saw. To see the true picture of the state of Jerusalem. He didn't go with the idea of whitewashing what he saw or having a optimistic view of things, even though things were terrible. You know, some people do that. They, well, it's not so bad. A little bit of paint, a little bit of glue, we're away. <laughs> Nehemiah didn't go with that attitude. It's amazing how quickly something that is broken, unfinished, or out of place can eventually become invisible to us. We don't see it anymore. It doesn't bother us anymore. When was the last time we Christians took a close look at what is happening around us? What about our family? Some of them are unsaved. Have we forgotten that they're headed for hell as long as they reject Christ as their Savior? What about our neighbors? How many of them are suffering from broken relationships, strained marriages, rebellious children, and other problems, illness, sickness? Are we being Christ-like in our love for them? What about our church? I find it so sad, and I feel so bewildered when I see brothers and sisters who are at odds with each other over silly and material, meaningless things, or saints who feel threatened by their brothers or sisters in Christ. When is the church going to be the church that Jesus expects it to be? For love reigns. What about our country? Our nation is... On the brink, I think, of disaster, we as a Christian, ha uh, as a country, I should say, have shoved God and his word out of the public sector and established in its stead a humanistic philosophy that will destroy our comfort, co uh, country if we don't experience true revival. You want proof? What about the 50 churches here in Canada this year that have been vandalized and burnt, some burned to the ground? That's here in Canada, this year. We need to look at our situation intently as Nehemiah did. And this cannot be done in a hurry and the scurry of life. Rather, it must be done in quietness with our heart and our eyes wide open so that we may see what God sees. 
So we see, we see things as he sees them. Nehemiah saw the broken down walls, the lack of defense, the discouragement of the people, the extinction of the Jewish people, the situation didn't change. That was going to happen. Nehemiah keeps his secret, doesn't he? Verse 16, the city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the religious and political leaders, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. You would think he would have gone straight to the top and said, boys, here's what we need to do. No, it was just God and Nehemiah. God had put a burden on Nehemiah's heart. He obviously hadn't put it on the leader's heart at all. Politicians today announce their plans to fix the, everything across the nation. And of course, they want all the publicity they can get. And their solution oft, often generates a whole host of problems they would never anticipated with their fixes. Maybe I'm being a little critical there. Officials of the city of Jerusalem did not know why Nehemiah had come to Jerusalem where he had or where he had gone the night before or what he had done even if they had known because he had not yet told them what God wanted them to do. He knew that if he told them, there would, but it would have been dozens of suggestions of how it should be done, or he would run into many who were skeptical and critical of his plans. There are times when we need to just keep quiet about our intentions for service in the work of the Lord. Why? We must let God reveal it to us and eventually to them. Why? The ex we must uh, let God reveal to us the extent of the need. Sometimes the need is much greater than we anticipate. And that he is able to help his people to do something about that need. Sometimes we're not convinced of that, are we? Then we must become convinced in our heart that God wants to use us to help meet that need. Obviously, we won't be doing it alone. Nehemiah didn't rebuild the walls alone. But he needs, we need to be convinced that God wants to work through us and others to see the need accomplished. You see, if we start right at telling people about our plans, people invariably say, it can't be done. It just can't be done. We tried it before, and it didn't work. Read my lips. It didn't work. You're just trying to upset everything we've got used to the way things are, so just don't upset the apple cart. Or who do you think you are anyways? Do you think you're better than us? Sharing the plan before our heart is fixed in God may result in us abandoning the will of God. In verse 17, Nehemiah issues a challenge. He said, now I said to them, you know full well the tragedy of our city. It lies in ruins, and its gates are burned. There was a situation. They knew it, but maybe weren't, you know, they become used to it. And then he adds this, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and rid ourselves of this disgrace. Let us rebuild. Nehemiah apparently had gotten the go-ahead from the Lord to, to sort of present his vision. He tells the people what they already know about the terrible condition of the city. Uh, but they had learned to become blind to the devastation all around them. They just didn't really see it anymore, so it had any meaning to them. Have you had to tell someone that what you already know about the spiritual uh, need of people? No doubt we've said, I know that. But what can I do? The trouble is, the things we know with our head, we don't often feel with our hearts, do we? We know it, but it's not here. It has to reach here. It has to reach the heart before God can really begin to work in our, our, our lives. So Nehemiah says in verse 17, Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Nehemiah is simply saying this. 
You see the distress, you see the extreme suffering and the need, you see how Jerusalem lies in waste. And he's referring to the ruins, the unproductive businesses, the neglected streets and gates, and scarcely occupied houses, and the failure to take advantage of some of the opportunities that is included there. And this is what they saw. They saw it every day, but that's all they saw. Their eye of faith was dead, and they had come to accept the condition of the city as being, well, normal. Nehemiah wanted them to see something else, something that God had shown him. He wanted them to see the walls rebuilt, the rubbish cleared away, the gates hanging on their hinges, and the city occupied and productive people living in the city happy and, and feeling safe. Nehemiah saw all of this with the eye of faith. People had not changed in this respect. We only see things as they are not as God wants them to be, right? So Nehemiah gives them a new vision by saying, come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And, and this new term for this is a vision casting. The first time I heard that, what is that? Vision casting. But I think that's really what Nehemiah was doing. He's casting a vision. Here's what God wants to do for us and through us. And here are some reasons for rebuilding Nehemiah could offer to them. That we may no longer be a reproach, that we no longer be disgraced, that we no longer be guilty of neglecting our duty to God and his people, that we may no longer give our enemies a reason to discredit us, that we may no, no longer be under God's rebuke for our failure to build and build his kingdom. Now, in verse 18, Nehemiah gives a personal testimony. He said, Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me, and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, Good, let us rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. Sometimes it's important to give your testimony. What God has been doing in your life inspires other people to catch the vision. See what Nehemiah tells them? That the hand of God had been working in his own heart and life. You see, before God can do anything through us, he must do something in us. Amen. He told them that God had moved the heart of the king. He served, and as a result, the king had given Nehemiah permission to go back to Jerusalem, which is authority. He had given him an armed escort, which was protection. He had given permission to use the timber from the king's force. He was equipping Nehemiah. He had given permission to travel through restricted territory. He was giving them open doors. He gave them, he gave Nehemiah words of encouragement or moral support. So I'm right behind you, Nehemiah. Will God do anything less for us? Will he not give us authority, protection, equipping, open doors, and the support that we need to do the job he's called us to do? I'm sure he will. He did it for Nehemiah. The response of the people was immediate. Let us rise up and build. They set their hands to do this good work. Notice it was a good work. Why? Because it was instigated by God himself. Well, whenever you're doing good work, guess what? There's opposition, isn't there? Verse 19. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, heard of our plans, they scoffed contemptuously. Didn't say that word right, but you know what I mean. What are you doing? Rebelling against the king like this, they said. They assumed that they knew what the king wanted. And there's sometimes people assume that they know what God wants when they haven't really been talking to the Lord. These guys have been, hadn't been talking to the king back in Persia, had they? They just assumed they knew. Some people assume they know the will of God and they haven't even talked to the Lord about it. When the enemies received the word of their plans, they laughed at them, they mocked them, they said they were worthless, and that it was impossible for them to do what they wanted to do. But let me remind you, whenever we do something for the Lord, you may as well count on the same thing happening. There will be resistance, maybe even more than just 
ordinary resistance. Verse 20 shows us their determination to trust God for what they lack. They said, the God of heaven himself, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. Praise the Lord. It's so much better when we let God lead us and direct us. Let me ask a few questions, pose a few questions perhaps, that may help us focus our attention on the real issues. Number one, has God given you an insight to a need that he wants you to do something about? Maybe it's just lately that he's been talking to you about something. It may not be big, it may be small, but who knows, it may be a beginning of something big. That's what happened to Billy Graham. Yes. Have you prayed and maybe fasted and wept over that need? Sometimes, you know, people will, will discover a need and they will, they will say, well, somebody should do this. Somebody should. If God shows you a need, don't you think he's expecting you to start with it? Don't pass it on to somebody else. It won't have the same heartfelt uh, drive behind it. Have you looked closely at that need? Have you examined it with the help of Holy Spirit? Will he not show you what to do next? He did with Nehemiah. The next step is simply to start. Start reaching out to that person who needs Christ. Start putting together a plan for ministry, whatever form it may be, or whatever the Lord has put into your heart to do. Verse 12, the plans of God that God had put in my heart. Plans that God had put in my heart. What are you going to do about the plans that God is putting in your heart or will put in your heart in the days that come? I'll finish with this story. It was around 1870. And New York City had one of the most hotly contested mayor races in its history. The incumbent was May Mayor John Tweed. Everybody called him Boss Tweed. And it was a name that suited him well. The time came when it, he ran for re-election and Boss Tweed's political machine began to roll. It represented politics at its very worst. His entire organization was corrupt to the core. But there are a number of committed citizens who decided they were fed up with this kind of politics and decided to fight City Hall. In the beginning, they seemed to be making a difference. But as the campaign dragged on, the cost of the commitment of time, money, and energy became more than most people were willing to pay. Many of the good people who initially believed in the importance of what they were doing began to drop out. The fight was ugly, and many of them did not have the stomach for it. So when the election was held and the results were counted, any hopes of a good city government were dashed. Boss Tweed had been reelected. The next day, the New York Times ran an editorial and analyzed what had happened. The article summed up the situation with these words. The good people quit being good before the bad people quit being bad. Folks, we can't afford to quit doing a good work for the Lord. It's tempting, I will grant you that. But we can't stop doing the thing that God has called us to do. Get your vision from the Lord. Let it fill your heart. Find out what God wants you to do. Listen to the Lord's direction and then do it. God will bring the, pro, uh, will prosper it. So has the Lord put something in your heart to do? Would you be willing to say, Lord, what you placed in my heart to do, I'm willing to commit myself to do it. I'm willing to pay the price for it to happen. Are you? Too many Christians resemble the old ramshackled church in Violet. No worship, no witness, no life. And that happens when we don't do what God has called us to do. Let us stand. 
Heavenly Father, we're just committing ourselves to you just now. We commit ourselves to do whatever you have, are laying upon our hearts. We want to serve you. We want to be uh, instruments in your hands, Lord. So we pray that you would lay upon our hearts something that will touch us to the very depths of our soul, not just our heads, but our hearts. And may we accomplish the work that you would want us to do. Go with us now, Lord, as we separate and go our ways. May we carry with us the desire to do whatever it is that you want us to do. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate you listening. It's an old preacher. <laughs> Yeah.